Welcome back to Radio Taiwan International. You're listening to Geek Out. What's your cup of tea? Tickles your fancy or floats your boat? Join us as we share passions from people in Taiwan and around the world. I'm your host, Michelle Chang, and today in the studio we have Hans. Can you please pronounce your last name for me? <laughs> Breuer. <laughs> so Mr. Hans, I'm not going to attempt it, is here to geek out with us about... Nature, in yeah. general. Tropical nature, especially. And uh, everything nature that people don't like. Um, <laughs> big hairy spiders, snakes, and carnivorous plants. Well, surprisingly, um, I'm okay with uh, big hairy spiders. But uh, yes, I'm not a cockroach person. That's all it is. So, so um, ready. <clears throat> I, I actually, um, I overheard Sharon and Chris talking about you coming in. And I was like, oh my goodness, is this the guy who did Snakes of Taiwan? Because I use, I got to give you a little background. When I moved here for high school, I lived in Sili Wai Xi in one of those Bie Su, like they're like a house style rather than apartments. Our back was to the jungle, which meant uh, we would get a lot of snakes in our house. And the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Oh, we didn't have a swimming pool, but okay. we had a garden and there were a lot of snakes. Mm -hmm. So at the time, your website was up which made it very easy to identify them. I was really glad to have the resource, especially since my mom is very snake phobic. Mm -hmm. There's a word for that. Ophidiophobic. Thank you, ophidiophobic. And I was the person who was who was uh, relegated to snake moving hmm. outing of the house. <laughs> yeah, if it's any comfort, that actually mm -hmm. happens all the time. I meet a lot of foreign friends here. They come here, they, uh, they're specialists for, I don't know, windmills or, or you know, wind power, what have right, you. Right, yeah. And uh, they move in the first time in Asia, move first time in the tropics, they move with this little nice villa in, in Tianmu, back to the forest, as oh, you said, yeah. the swimming pool out there. And in the third, on the third day, they find a cobra in the swimming pool. <laughs> so in panic, they go online yeah. and they go like, oh my God, oh God we're going to do this. And that? then they find Snakes of Taiwan, which is not only a website, but mm -hmm. also a Facebook group. Oh, nice. I did not know it was a Facebook group. Yeah, same thing, That's just great. Snakes of Taiwan. And, um, and then every time, because um, I... I said, do you have children? Would you like to know more about nature here in Taiwan, especially the nocturnal stuff? Mm -hmm. Because uh, at night you see much, much more. Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, so if you guys are interested, come out. You know, I live on the northern side of Yaminshan. Yeah. We have dinner together and then we drove up, drive up the hill and I'll show you some yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic idea. We were yeah. just, Sharon was just in the studio and we were talking about actually going out on a night hike. Mm. And uh, yeah, well, considering a lot of species are crepuscular, meaning they're, they begin activity at dusk. Uh, that would be that would be fantastic. I'd love to do it. Crepuscular <laughs> also means mosquitoes, so I I, 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 I like to. I can cover at, myself. <laughs> yeah, I can cover myself in insect repellent. Does that does that work? Yes, yeah, good if, idea. if you if you want to burn your skin <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> Snakes are a specialty of yours. Yeah, it was one of them. Yeah, yeah. I, as I said, it's it's. Um, I started out in two thousand two, I think, mm -hmm. when a friend of mine gave me. A tropical pitcher plant, a carnivorous plant. I was just reading this in your book. Yeah, and uh, he, I had never had a plant in my life apart from the, the lettuce and my crisper, you know. And <laughs> and I, so I took the plant and I killed it within ten days. You and know, I, said, oh. I did that too in the beginning. Mm, it happens. That's what one does. Mm -hmm. But it really, I really loved the little plant. So long story short, two years later, um, we moved out to the countryside. I was living at the time. I was living in Beitou, but then we moved out to the countryside to Beixinzhong in the northern, northern part of. Um, Yang mm -hmm. and I had a greenhouse with about 350 or 400 kind. Uh, p p That's how it goes. Yep, yeah, it does, doesn't it? 400 species of uh, different subspecies or No, 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 no they're all the same species. Oh. Uh, sorry, all the same genus, Nepenthes, mm. tropical pitcher plants. That's, that's really neat, though. That's right. how it starts. <laughs> that's how it starts. <laughs> obsession with that. Uh, yeah, with the obsession. Yeah. That's, that's right. Absolutely. That's right. Um, well, I was reading the, the okay, so, so Hans's book is called A Greenhorn Naturalist in Borneo. Mm. First of all, I gotta say, I, I just opened it while waiting to uh, to pop into the studio with you, and I love your writing style. Thank you. It's actually really entertaining, and because you know people could write about stuff like you know pitcher plants in a fairly scientific, sterile Everybody does way, that. <laughs> and you know that doesn't tend to pique people's interest. But um, but yeah, you write about it in a way that that people anyone who's actually started an obsession on anything can identify with. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. So the pitcher plant started it. That's right. And in 2007, there was an international conference on the genus, the Penthes, in Sarawak, which is one of the two Malaysian states mm -hmm. on Borneo, on the island of Borneo, in Kuching, the capital of Sarawak. Right. So I went there and for 10 days, and there was a conference, and they took us to the jungle. And I came back after 10 days, and I walked up to my little greenhouse, <laughs> and I opened the door, and I looked at my plants and said, 
<laughs> sorry, ladies. No, I'm sorry. That it doesn't it. cut it anymore. It just doesn't <laughs> cut it anymore. So basically, mm -hmm. I walked down into the living room and said to my wife, we got to move to Borneo. I have oh. to live where these things are. Right. Lisa. Because Lisa, right? Lisa, yeah. yeah okay. And because um, the wild animals and plants of any kind, if you have any of those in your house and... and, and it's whatever, not the same. It's not the same. It's like timber wolves and chihuahuas, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, so we discussed that a little bit and the ups and downs and the ups were my children were six and nine at the time at the and time. Where so they were quite young yeah two boys and mm -hmm. they were in this really cute lovely forest school in uh, Beijing 90 children in the whole school oh, well, every that, everybody's family that sounds great that was fantastic yeah. but then what was the next step uh, middle school here Dan Shui. Uh, uh, I've seen too many gangster kids there, yeah. and uh, and so American school, European school, I couldn't. Very expensive. That. Very expensive. Too expensive for me, and so I found this this uh, British curriculum school, which was actually founded by the Brits in Kuching, uh, in Malaysia, the Lodge School, which has a hundred percent British education curriculum for a fraction of what I was paid here. Wow. And so I looked at Lisa and said, what do you think about, you know, picking up sticks and moving to Borneo? She goes like, right on, let's go. Wow. What son had to attack, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's that's a huge move for most people. Uh, it's, well, I mean, having met you, I'm sure you, I'm sure that Lisa, hmm. the person whom you chose, hmm. is uh, very, I guess, open-minded to these kinds of things. She, Nature. Yeah, she, Nature if she wants, animals. yes, he has to. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. And also, I mean, one thing about Malaysia is that there's a lot of Chinese people that is, that's true. Ch of, of Chinese mm -hmm. uh, heritage. And uh, I mean, we all speak Mandarin and uh, my kids and my wife speak Taiwanese, which is a kind of, uh, well, what do they speak in there? Fu they, Fu Jianhua, Fu yeah. Yeah. So that was easy it's for them. close enough so that they, yeah, could, yeah, they could yeah. communicate. So English, not, not being able to speak English wasn't so scary for my wife. Mm. Uh, when we moved there, so we got we got lots of uh, Chinese friends there. Oh, that's et cetera, great. Et cetera. Yeah. So you spent eight years. Nine. Nine. Sorry. Nine yeah. years down yeah. in uh, down in uh, Malaysia. Yes. Um, in Borneo. Borneo, Malaysia. Yeah. Right. Mm. But how did you like? Where did you live there? I imagine that you you had a hut in the jungle, but I'm sure that was not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I felt I, I I led a pretty much suburban life, and right. it's in your yeah. tiny little. Uh, Little, well, two-story house with a tropical colonial roof slung oh, out wow. to the side against the sun. We had a little back backyard mm -hmm. full of um, frogs and mosquitoes and and a front yard f space for two pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. We only had one, but uh, <laughs> so that's and yeah, school was nearby. Small town had everything we needed, and I run a translation company for video games online, so I can live anywhere I want. But that's basically. true. And you that work was, from home. I work from home. So. Yeah, so that was arrangement, but. The jungle was never further than 45 minutes away because Kuching has three really nice national parks around it. Right. I need to look at a map. <laughs> Bonnie bon is really big. It's yeah, bigger it's, than it's Texas. Fairly, it's, yes, it's a huge place. It's a fairly place, large yeah. uh, island country. Uh, island. Mm, island, yeah, yeah. island. So you're never further than 45 minutes away from a jungle. Yes. How often were you in the jungle? Every night. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's... <clears throat> because, um, I, of course, I took my hobby there for looking for snakes. And... Yeah. Uh, one way of finding snakes is just driving up and down mountain roads mm -hmm. and wait and you know see if they cross the road eventually they do yeah they do and they found a bunch a bunch of places where i could do that outside of kuching um so i pretty much yeah i'd say like three four nights a week ah oh. well um well a couple of questions about the snakes that you would find say in taiwan versus the snakes you found down mm -hmm. in borneo mm -hmm. um considering this is all kind of southeast asia mm. west western asia southeast asia kind southeast of asia. <laughs> right so did you feel did you see a lot of similar species or there were there a lot of um w aside from the snakes that are endemic mm. to taiwan or let's we'll start with this mm. taiwan has about what 60 plus species right borneo has 165 mm -hmm. among them the biggest snake in the world which is able capable to eat a, a human being the burmese adult, python uh, the, the reticulated python oh, reticulated. which we found we mm -hmm. also got well, basically, pretty much everything we have here, but twenty times the size. Uh, <laughs> yes, we have well, co we have a cobra here, but they yes, got the king cobra. They do. Yes, that is an impressive snake. That is I've, impressive I've snake. gotten to see one, um, you know, I guess in the flesh mm. once, and um, they call it the king cobra because, similar to king snakes, they eat other snakes. That's right. That's mm. right. Yeah, they specialize in that, and they they're very. I've only gotten to see. Uh, one live adult in those nine years that somebody found it in his kitchen called me up and said can you take it away from me 
um, yeah, and so he had packed it up in a little cage already, and that was formidable. Actually, in that book, there's a story about it. How? How, did, how did he? Oh, how did he get it into a cage? To be? Oh, he a, did. He did. Okay. He had a cage, and they found it, and it's, uh, somehow he manhandled it into the into it. A king cobra. A king cobra. It was, on, it was it was a small one, only three meters long. Oh, okay. Only three meters, yes. you guys. Listeners, so, only three meters. <laughs> so I, all four of these things, I always have a. Uh, I had a, a big bucket in the back of my truck, and right. so we put that in the bucket, and they went out to the forest, took a bunch of pictures, and then let it go. Right. And yeah, that was quite um, first time in my life ever that I got attacked by a snake, but I actually didn't get attacked because it was a it was fainting. Oh. But it was we had this. I little, mean, generally speaking, snakes would much rather use their 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 biter venom against a, prey rather than against you. It's just a waste <clears> of energy. Exactly. So yeah. So uh, even even then, so I mean, mm-hmm. even reticulated pythons, mm-hmm. every all snakes just go away when you come because they they have no use for you. Nope, they do not recognize people as prey <laughs> That's at right. all. That's right. So it's uh, uh yeah, I'm sure you covered a lot of this. By the way, guys, tune into. That's debatable with Sharon Lynn. Uh, she and Hans cover a lot of misconceptions about snakes, which is, I think, really important to listen to, especially um, in Taiwan, because a lot of the, as you outline on your website, a lot of the mentality around snakes mm. is still very traditional. It used to be. Mm. And I'm pretty sure in the countryside where I live, it's it's still that same. But as I just mentioned to Michelle, that like after we came back from Borneo nine years later, I go up to my favorite uh Snake cruising road to Saturday mm. night where you expect to see the usual biology g- geeks and the, and the snake freaks <laughs> and looking for snakes and for photograph. What do I find? Whole families. Oh, wow. What we like to call in the That's trade. That's amazing. Civilians. <laughs> Whole is, families. That, and we go up yeah. to say, what are you guys looking here for? It's like grandpa, grandma, mom and dad and two, three children. I say, what are you guys looking for? Fireflies? Mm-hmm. He's like, no, 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 no. Don't you know? We got all spiders up here and snakes and all kind of cool stuff and bugs and we're going to show it to the children. That's fantastic. Whoa, within nine years, Mm -hmm. education. Yes. I was really shocked. I mean, I've been, um, when I moved back here in high school, uh, I was just getting into having pets because, you know, parents, they don't let me have a lot of of things. So then I I moved to, uh, I moved back to the States where I lived, um, independent of my parents, and then wound up getting into the the pet industry. And and, um, I didn't, have the space for a dog or a cat so i got into exotics which can be housed usually in a tank so um so i had king snakes in the states i had a hmm. there was a I, well you start with the california king snake right. which is your pretty good beginner guy and then an uh, arizona mountain and uh, i wound up working with a pet company that dealt in exotics so everything from you know the the what we got to watch like green pythons snatch a bird out of the air that kind of thing they're really neat yep. so uh i came to taiwan a- again um later on and then was disappointed because you can't import snakes easily into Taiwan as pets. But you I can. Have, you can. It's it's a quite a lengthy process. You just freeze and put them for, into the freezer for five minutes and oh. then go on the plane. I know people who do that. <laughs> that is true. I'm sure people do this. <laughs> okay, let's say legally. No, okay, guys, no, really. we, we don't support that you do this at all. But yes, it's it's, an, it's a process to import any any animal into Taiwan, actually. Yeah, of course. So I left my snakes in the U.S. and I, I got here and I really wanted to keep snakes again. Um, but found that was uh, uh, early, early 2010s uh-huh. teens. That still the mentality was still very much um, traditional. That's changed yes. a lot, right? It has changed so much. Um, last a few a few weeks ago, there was a, a Herpetal Expo, Exotic Pets Expo. I know. The, yeah. Were you there? Did you go my, see it? My snake dealer went there. Oh yeah. Because when when I go to this when I do these snake shows, I don't mm-hmm. use Taiwanese snakes anymore. I just go to him. And I rent two really big pythons oh, great. For, for one day. Right. That's it's, you know he, he makes some money. Mm-hmm. I get bigger snakes than I would get here, and then right. I wild animals. And yeah, the, the stuff they breed is just incredible. It's incredible now. There's so many color morphs yeah. and exotic species that were not available um, in the in the 2000 I guess teens. Mm. But the uh, the there were so many people at this expo. So many people. Yeah, I saw pictures. Yeah. It was like a night market in there. Yeah. So I I was barely able to see anything um but i did snag a bunch of photos of of the companies and then later went online and you know checked out their facebook pages and stuff there's been huge progress with breaking down uh stereotypes and misconceptions just within the past decade yeah so yeah so, so you the, yeah go ahead. but this guy does my my friend he lives in geelong mm-hmm. um he actually he's, he's very young he's a 21 or something but he makes money by just going with a bunch of friends into a park mm-hmm. him with a three meter um mango colored uh, reticulated python around his neck 
his buddy with uh, some iguana or what yeah. have you. And they just sit there on a the bench. People and eventually, come up and ask for pictures. Children will come and say, hey, you know and then the, the the parents come up and boo, 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 they say okay you want to see more of these animals you want us to do a little uh show yeah. privately at your home that's two thousand bucks and tea ah, you make money. two hours and they make money from that nice. yeah and you know it's great especially for educating small children yeah, um definitely. as as you say on your website kids yep. don't have a fear of small animals ones. like snakes yeah. small children don't have a fear of them it's the adults that ruin mm-hmm. it for them yeah. and and that's actually true of many many subjects <laughs> 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 the adults true. ruin the children a little bit so mm-hmm. back to borneo though so you went down there for your love of of uh, pitcher plants and snakes in the end and then. snakes yeah, course, and yeah. um and what wound up happening down there i want to hear like like uh g- give me an example of a neat story <laughs> okay, let's, let me tell you about a typical day. Mm-hmm. I get up in the morning, I take the kids to school, and then I go to a big, a big wet market and get all I need for cooking, and then stay at home and translate. And my, my wife uh, probably is at the same wet market, and basically we have <laughs> just like a very humdrum kind of, a kind of suburban life. Yeah. And after dinner, I pack the kids in the, tr- in the, in the truck, or vi- because ever since I moved to Borneo, people found me online. People oh. I had been on herpetological... Um, uh, websites before right, in like, communities, like, in communities. Mm-hmm. and they was like oh you're in Borneo can I visit you I was like hell yeah you know so pretty much on an average of six weeks every six weeks I would have somebody from Australia from South America somebody they they, they lived there, they you know they stayed at our house and I took them herping every night looking for snakes um, yeah um, it was a whole bunch a whole series of very very interesting things what I found most interesting though is actually that you go to Borneo as a specialist, in my case, for carnivorous plants right. and for snakes. Mm-hmm. And if you don't leave as a generalist <laughs> in love with everything, then there's something wrong with you. I mean, that is the general consensus from people who, as you say in your book, you, if people who manage to leave. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and for, for me, for me, it was, it was um, okay, um, you go into the jungle and you see all this cool stuff, the, the Tarsus, these tiny little, these tiny little, um, primates they look like the gremlins actually the gremlins were modeled on them they're only carnivorous primates in the world yes and you see those and you see the bugs and you see bigger bugs and you see stick insects the, the length the length of your your your, L, arm, your yep. arm half you your, your arm forearm, right? <laughs> and everything's like oh my god and you get really sucked into it mm-hmm. and then about three years into borneo something happened that i would never have thought before i became a birder oh because well, that's a good location to be a birder <laughs> uh, Taiwan is actually even better, but but that's it's 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 yeah. So um, when I was still a snake nerd mm-hmm. <clears throat> before that, birds for me were like, who's interested in birds? Fat middle-aged people who, <laughs> oh. s- who sit on yeah, the yeah, that is kind of true. You picture that, right? Yeah, do you, uh, they go to Costa Rica. They sit and... on the they sit on the uh, on on the on the porches of these ecologists and they feed the birds. They come from the jungle. That right. kind of like mm-hmm. stuff. So birds for me were like snake yeah. food. Yeah. Snake food. Snake food. Feed them to snakes. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then uh, we had this little jungle forest like like two kilometers down from the road. And it was basically a jogging forest, yeah. but it's a, a remnant of an old swamp forest. All kinds of cool stuff in there. So I meet this um, this um, Western guy. He's like short, paunchy, white hair. And he's, he's lugging around this 600 millimeter camera. Ooh. And around his neck, there's a really, really, really expensive pair of binoculars. So right. I woke up to him and said, oh, you, see, you seem to be in the stems of his eye. So he says, hey, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for dracos. Now, dracos are flying lizards. They are. They are tiny little, very thin. You know them, right? Yes, I know them. And animals that sit on the bark of trees all day and lap up ants are totally yeah. boring. But their ribs are yeah. close to the body. And when they spread them out, they look like Wings. smog, five, 50 million to one size. <laughs> <laughs> it's just they incredible. Were no, they were named very aptly. They do look like tiny little dragons. They do. They do. <laughs> And so I went to this parking lot all the time because I knew the dracos were in the palm trees around mm-hmm. it. I've never seen one. It took me two years to see the first one. And then with this, he's, he says, oh, dracos. Oh, he says, oh, we see them all the time. I was like, as, oh, we no. as in who? The birders. Well, we're birders. <laughs> it's just, I, you know, my neck was this already. And I said, why do we see dracos? You don't even look for them. I said, well, we look in the trees, don't we? Yeah, that's true. And he says, why don't you have a look through my... Swarovski binoculars, three thousand dollar, three thousand dollar Swarovski yeah, yeah. binoculars. And, and I amazing. took these new binoculars <laughs> and I looked through it. And first of all, if you look through through a pair of really really expensive binoculars, it's the fourth dimension. Yeah, they light up things without electronics because just the the, 
the, the optics are fantastic. And lo and behold, within 10 minutes, I found not one, but two Dracos on the palm trees. <laughs> Amazing. And he said, so what else are you interested in? I said, you know, orchids and pitcher plants. He said, I don't understand why you're not sleeping with a pair of binos next to your pillow because the, the orchids, the pitcher plants, they're in the trees in at the, the trees. business end of the, of the jungle. Right. Everything is in the trees. Mm -hmm. And you can only really see up there um, either by being an extremely good tree climber or <laughs> with binoculars. Or a hot, hot, hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. So long story short, six months later, I, I forced myself to spend a ton of money on a really good pair nice. of size binoculars and they've never left my side since. Well, so. to be fair, they do last a long oh, time. Incredible. You don't need anything <laughs> else then. And then when I came back to Taiwan, of mm -hmm. course, I realized that I had lived here for 25 years without realizing it's one of the biggest bird paradises on, on oh, Earth. Oh yeah, we see definitely, I mean, if you look online, there's um, mostly in Chinese, uh, but there are, there's birding communities that go oh, yeah, everywhere around the island. Yeah. Um, they, there's also like tours that you can sign up for and mm -hmm. things like that. It's amazing. I really wish there were more herping, as you said. Thank you for using that term. People, uh, herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles, uh, generally the whole group. Uh, so herping is to go out and look for them. That's right. <laughs> Yes. So right. Oh, but I'm it's, so excited. But it's, it's really difficult. What you can really go. I've participated in frog tours. Specifically looking only in, for in frogs. Borneo. Okay. In Borneo, because there's one one frog pond in Borneo that has up to seventy species, but it's one pond in the jungle, and that's where they all are every night, and it's reliable. It's like looking for birds of paradise in New Guinea. Mm. Did they're they're not rare. Trees? You just have to know which tree they are at ah. four in the morning. That's they go there and they look at them. End of story. But snakes, not so much. No, snakes are uh, few. They're far between because they're predatory. Yes. Which means they, you know, you don't find a huge cluster unless breeding. No. No, not even. No, mm. not even that. Mm. In Canada, you have the uh, <laughs> the, the garter snakes. Garter snake breeding balls. Clusters, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but not so much. Not so much here. But anyways, uh, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, right. Time flies when you're talking sure, about yeah, stuff that you love. But right, uh, thanks for geeking out with me. Thanks, listeners, for tuning in. This is uh, Radio Taiwan International. You've been listening to Geek Out. And we'll be back next week, Thursday, with another episode. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys, I'm back. I almost forget. Don't forget to check out Hans's books, A Cobra Hijacked My Camera Bag and A Greenhorn Naturalist in Borneo. Both really good reads and available on Amazon and other places. And don't forget to check out his website, snakesoftaiwan.com. It's a fantastic reference site.